Alright, so um I think it was counting for a second here. On Wednesday we had Had just left off talking. About the effectiveness um, and the techniques and traits that predators can use and praise can then subsequently use, <clears throat> sort of in their um, proverbial arms race against each other. Right. So if I want to be more successful, um, <clears throat> As a predator, I, I want to have specific adaptations, both morphological, right, physical, um, and or behavioral, to <coughs> make me a better or more effective hunter. <coughs> and as a prey, I also want to not die. That's a pretty high risk situation. I would also have um, morphological and behavioral techniques or traits help me not die, right, or survive. So we first thought about these from the predator standpoint um, and put them in several categories, thinking about how as a hunter could we go about this. And then we stopped um, before going into some specific examples because it was a lot to take on. So let's look at some specific examples. So if I want to think about um, some clear examples for capture and avoidance, okay. from the capture standpoint, okay, we had several behavioral ones on the previous page. I wanted to make sure that we also had some morphological ones to think about. So our behavioral category is the same list that we had on the previous page. Right, so we had active foraging. Okay, so what we thought about is active hunting, right, our classic sort of wolf strategy. Okay. We had our ambush strategy. Okay. And we had our trap strategy. From a morphological standpoint, okay, we have a, several different things we can think about of how can you increase your capacity to help these techniques. Okay, so if I wanted to be a better searcher, right, a better active hunter, nothing searcher is a word, but it's Friday, so it is today. Okay, I might, for example, have a body like a cheetah. Okay. So some morphological traits that make me faster. Okay, so a burst speed runner. And I might be quieter. We could think of something like an owl, right? Silencers on its wings. I'm an ambush predator and you would want some kind of technique that allows you to tackle most any prey that you are going to have come across your path and quickly. Okay. The ability to open your jaw quite wide so tackle a larger variety of prey. Okay. Venom in snakes also helps. Right, so do your prey quite quickly, so they're less likely to be able to get away. They can tackle a wider variety of prey, since they're sort of banking on the prey coming to them. Okay. 
if I were to think about, for example, our carnivorous dry root thing. Our carnivorous plants. Secretes of mucus and along its upper ridges. If you're familiar with a pitcher plant, it's shaped a bit like a cup. Pitcher plants are amazing, by the way, if you're not familiar. Uh -uh. And so along the upper ridges, they're very smooth. They have a mucus secreted, so anything that lands there sort of slips in, falls to its doom. It's basically an open stomach, so all of this is like an acid. The organism is slowly digested. So each predator is going to have at least one. Okay, morphological trait or technique that makes it really effective at hunting or capturing its prey. Good at eating, in other words, right? But what we want to keep in mind, and what my box is talking about here, is there's no such thing as the perfect system, right, or the, the perfect predator. And we want to keep in mind when we think about that from evolution or from an ecological standpoint. Okay, for everything that a predator does, and this is something that you'll look at when you do your red queen activity, and there's also a predator, or a, oh, boy, I have to try today. There's also a prey trying not to die. Okay, so it's a really complicated tango. So let's look at our example here. Okay, so the rough skin newt this handsome little fellow here is a common prey item for garter snakes. So if you ran into a snake Probably, unless you're Dr. Watson, they have run into a garter snake. He seems to run into like cobras because that's, of course, what he runs into on his walks. Right. But most of us run into garter snakes. They're harmless and hang out like in your backyard. So they eat these guys. Most things don't eat these guys because they have tetrodotoxin, which is the same kind of poison that you find in like a puffer fish. It's pretty hardcore. And it's a neurotoxin, knocks most people down, like humans, knocks you down. Totally reasonable amounts. Okay, so in order for our garter snakes to hack our newts, right, we still want to be effective predators, they have evolved resistance to this poison. Good, right? Makes you a more effective predator, I'm more competitive, I have a broader diet of things I can eat. Know that that's something that we like to see in a predator. Okay, but, okay, that's problematic. And so here's where it comes down to. If you are going to be resistant to this poison, okay, we lose speed. And here's why. So remember okay, that snakes in general are ectothermic. Right? They're cold-blooded animals. And so they have to go to a lot of trouble, right, absorb stuff from their surrounding environment to make their body work. Okay. Breaking down... The toxins in this newt is a lot of extra work. It's hard, hard work. So they can do it, right? But it's 
hard work. So they have to use a lot of extra energy, which for a snake comes at a cost, right? We have to absorb extra heat, extra warmth from the surrounding area to get this done, which means for a snake, you're stuck. So if somebody comes along and wants to eat said snake, you just got to watch it happen. Okay, during this very vulnerable time. If very suddenly okay, there's a temperature spike okay, or a temperature drop during the day, post McGee. So you've got yourself a good competitive meal that comes at a high risk. So where you eat this meal, what time of day you eat this meal, all of these things are really important and it's risky. Okay, so this is what we mean by a non-perfect system, right? It's coming at some kind of cost. Now, is it worth it? It might be. It might be the only food around. Maybe it's a beautiful day. Maybe there aren't any predators. So none of these other things matter. Maybe they can make it back to their den. So they're super safe. But it is a cost. example make sense? So that's what we mean by arms race. So the newt has this really powerful toxin that makes, first off, most things not be able to tackle it at all. And the things that can, right, still are paying some kind of fee, energetic fee to do it. So let's look at this from the prey's perspective. How might I respond to a predator? How might I save myself from being eaten? Okay, so let's focus on the behavioral side first. Some of these we've probably seen before. The first two examples, um, and we talked about the first one several times, right? Because this is kind of the easiest one to think about, right? Don't be stupid. Okay. Hide, be conservative or be careful, right? Don't stick your furry butt out where the wolves be active. Okay, so if I'm a hare, okay. I don't want to go sticking my butt out in the broad daylight where there are a lot of wolves acting out. So just be more conservative or shy. Okay. Defensive circles. This is the second one. We see in slightly larger organisms, particularly mammals, caribou, musk, oxen, any um, ungulate hooved animal that breeds in groups tends to do this. Okay. The larger organisms will put their butts out and put like the smaller females and babies in the center. This makes it difficult, honestly, for anybody to be picked off because then they just sort of become like one large animal. Okay, let's look at behavior of plants because we tend to forget that plants can also have behavior. All right, so the two biggest behaviors we see in plants are called compensation and masting. Okay. The example I have in the picture here um, in the bottom right-hand corner is an image of compensation. 
Um, and this is a behavior plants do in response to predation. And so <clears throat> um, some plants, when they experience damage, in this case we've done human damage, clipping, literally taking a scissors or a shears, right, and snipping off parts of the plant. <clears throat> And so we can see, right, the top of this, the top of this image is the baby before either growth type is allowed. Okay, so our left hand image is unclipped, okay, meaning that this plant has been allowed to grow unfettered or naturally undisturbed. Unfettered is a great word, right? That's not used enough, I feel like. Right. The right-hand side of this image is clipped, okay? meaning that someone has gone through and caused tissue damage and tissue removal to this plant. Okay. So what we see here is that in the damaged version, that the plant has responded to that damage and invested additional energy into growing more plant tissue. So kind of literally in anticipation of continual predation, right, continual herbivory, okay, the plant increases the amount of growth hormone it has and grows more um, often flowers, but not necess necessarily. It may also, depending on the time of year, grow more leaf to allow for additional photosynthesis. Whereas in the unclipped, if it's never experienced any damage, it has no reason to respond by increasing that growth hormone. It just kind of like lives its best life. It grows slower and often grows less, either leaves or flowers. So it's not trying to compensate for the, the predation or that herbivory event, or events as appropriate. So this is what we mean by compensation. Any questions about that? Okay, so then let's talk about masting. Masting is the unpredictability of a feast or famine of seed. So we see like acorn trees, right? Oaks, <laughs> walnuts sometimes do these. Um, trees do this. So oak trees, for example, will have some years where they just drop like a bajillion acorns all at once. It's a feast year, right? So the squirrels go freaking insane, like yes, all the acorns. And so you see a whole bunch of squirrels come out, and this is now their preferred food. <clears throat> so they go out, they're digging out these acorns, blah, 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 blah. And in these years, some of these acorns may live and some won't. Okay. But the key here is this doesn't happen every year. It doesn't even happen most years. Several years in a row will occur for very few acorns will come out of these trees, what we call famine years, right? And so most birds and squirrels do not keep these trees in mind. They won't nest in these trees primarily. Okay? They won't feed in these trees primarily. These aren't a core or preferred source of food because they're not dependable. Okay? Most squirrels and birds have really good memory, and birds in particular right, pass these memories on to their offspring to go to the same sites over and over again. And so what masting allows for is when they do have these feast years, it's like a surprise. Right, so there's a little bit of a safety in number 
situation. And then there's that lag of now all the animals kind of have to figure out what's going on and then come find all of those spaces that have the acorns, which increases the likelihood of those acorns being able to survive. And then on the off years, the few that do drop are much more guaranteed to live. Okay, any questions about our behavioral stuff? Okay, for morphological, if these are anything that's going to basically do the opposite of all of the stuff we just saw. Okay, so if we have a fast running predator, having a fast running prey, right, is going to be super helpful. Those heels. If you have organisms that have really sharp teeth and really sharp claws, certainly having anything that's going to increase that handling time. Right? So remember, when you're a preferred prey choice, your abundance is going to be one thing. Really not much you can do to adjust that, right? You don't really want to lower your birth rate or increase your death rate. So increasing your handling time is the other thing that you have some control over. So body armor is a piece of that. A pangolin is a bit like an armadillo, if you're not familiar. The other thing you can do it is surpass what's called the predator's gape limitation. A gape limitation is just referring to gape being how wide you can open your mouth. And most organisms are pretty like straightforward, right? You know exactly how far you can open your mouth. Okay. The food that you get has to fit in that hole. Okay, and that's the case for most organisms, right? If it's bigger than your hole, it cannot go in. And okay, now for mammals, there is a little more variety here, right? Because mammals tear and chew food. If, but still, and most mammals are not going to tackle food that is significantly larger than they are. Right? So, for example, if you get a very large size, we consider things like elephants, hippopotami, manatee. These are very large organisms. There ain't a lot that tackle this. Right? Even lions are extraordinarily tepid about tackling an elephant. It's skin is very thick, its butt is very large, and the repercussions are if it fights back, the damage, the risk there is extraordinary. So you better feel super confident about what you're doing. And now some do, right, there are some packs of lionesses that will work together in fours and fives to take them down, but it's rare. Great scientific studies, kind of rare. Okay, the last thing, of course, is coloration. So we know right, that some organisms are poisonous. A poison is something you eat, a venom is, ooh, a venom is something you inject. And being poisonous does make you less likely to be eaten. Okay. Not a perfect solution, as we saw in the last slide. Some things will still eat you, but it will reduce the number of things that will eat you. Because okay. now not everything will eat that salamander. Just a handful of things that have managed to evolve a way to cope with that toxin will eat you. And that's still good. Okay. But you also need some capacity to tell 
things that you're poisonous. Otherwise, it's not super helpful. So if we come back and check him out, right, our little rough skin newt has aposematic coloring. Right? The most common is bright red. It's not exclusive, particularly um, in the southern hemisphere, right in South America and parts of Africa. We see yellows and blues, particularly in like the poison dart frog family. And so anything that's super brightly colored sometimes can mean that, but most of the time red is sort of like literal red flag, right? Didn't eat me or you're going to die. So we have some kind of coloration that says you're going to die. Then we have our cheaters. I'm not actually going to make you die, but I'm going to lie about it. Right, when you lie on your resume, so get the job. And both of those are generally pretty effective. Because right, either you're actually toxic and things aren't going to eat you, because they're likely going to die, or how big of a chance are you going to take that eating that may or may not kill you? Like the reason I don't tend to pick mushrooms in the forest is I'm not that good at identifying them, and I really don't want to find out the hunt way. <laughs> we also have trypsis. So instead of just plain hiding, which is behavioral, sit in your burrow. A crypsis is actively being camouflaged. Okay, so like the gray tree frog. Okay, literally gray and speckled. So when they sit up against tree bark, they look like tree bark. The leaf insect or the katydid did look like grass. Right? And so it's not necessarily that they're actively hiding, per se, although they could be when they're not moving or they're up in the tree hiding, but they're also camouflaged. They're difficult to see because of the way they look. So they could be sitting on your windowsill, but because they blend in with your windowsill, you don't see them. Okay, so certainly in both of these, okay, this is not all of the techniques ever, but these are a lot of really good examples, and I've got a bunch of these in all of our units, and these will be helpful to go back and look at too. For example, if you chose predator prey for your red queen, um, this will be a good example table to start with so you can get an idea of what kinds of things to use. Any questions about any of this stuff? Hit record, right? <laughs> well, that's now in the recording, but that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a look at these two graphics. Um, so take a couple minutes, I want you to look at these two graphics, and then let's talk about what they mean.
상담이신가? Let's give this a try. So what is graphic A telling me? Well, what's on my x-axis? Snail species, right? So I have four different snail species. Oops. And as the pictures show me, right, we must be looking at different shaped shells. Okay, so what's on my y axis? Handling time. Okay. In fact, increasing handling time, right? So what's my take-home message from A? Okay, so some species have better body armors than others. In other words, different handling time. So who's the best and who's the worst? So this guy has the lowest handling time, right? So how you spell that? And hmm. yep, so it's like right there, and I'm still struggling with this <laughs> handling. Meaning, as Jenna described, right, that they have probably the worst body armor. That makes sense, right? As we look at this poor little guy, right, we see that his shell is quite elongated. So it's not reinforcing itself well. So if you were to pinch on that, it would crumble quite easily under your fingers. So the best then, right, they ordered these very nicely for us. Okay, so the highest handling time. It would take the longest to eat this guy whatever it is that's eating this guy, okay, is actually this guy down here. And so we see this guy has concentric circles. It's very spirally. You see, this shell does a good job of reinforcing itself. Okay, so it would take a lot more pressure to break this shell. Or you'd have to open it up and try to, like, it out or something, right? It's a lot harder to get at this guy. Does everybody see that from our graph one? Make sense? Great job. Let's look at graph B now. What is graph B telling us? So which species is best at avoiding predators? So they're both kind of saying the same-ish thing. Okay? So what would we mean by avoiding predators? 
So we might be more camouflaged. We certainly look more boring. What else might we be doing? They might be hiding, right? Maybe they go in their little snaily burrows. They might get up and walk away. Maybe they look a little bit more mobile. Okay. So it may be, right, literally in opposing order. Okay. Our Litterina friends know that the predators, because they're easier to eat, right, they have a lower handling time. Okay. So they would be a preferential food. They need to do something about that. Okay. So they have some technique, some trait. Okay, to avoid predation. It might be their coloring, it might be that they're hiding, okay, they're only going to eat at night, whatever it is. Okay? These guys, because they know they're easy pickings, they are making it harder to at least find them. Because the predators want to eat them. It's so much easier to eat them. Right, good job with that. There's a lot to unpack in these. Any questions? Okay, so again, we want to think about what we just saw here as a trade-off system, right? No snail here was perfect. And there would be no point to be, right? It's too expensive to be perfect. If I invest all my energy into being the perfect prey, uh, prey avoidance, right? So no predator, in this case the shore crab, can never find me and can never eat me. I would never get to invest any energy in eating, or I'd never get to invest any energy in breeding and having little snail babies, right? I'd have to invest all of my energy in not dying. Okay, so I have to trade off. So here we see the trade off right, between okay, putting energy in my morphology, okay, my, cell, my shell shape, so either I made a good tight spiral, or behavior. I avoided the predator. Hit. Okay, so I'm going to invest the energy in one or the other. But not both. It's too expensive to do both. Crabs will probably still eat some of everybody. He's not going to eat all of one species, right? Now nobody is easy picking. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm ready for lunch. Any questions about the example we've worked through here? 
I don't want to start a new graph. So. Apparently everyone else is done, so I guess let's be done. <laughs> Good gravy.